I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Stephen. I'm very happy to be here. I was always impressed. The, uh, oops, let me get the Godhead out of here. Yeah, I'm always expressed how relaxed and how not competitive this, uh, speakers here were. They were just leading us into their field of study. They were wonderful in a way, and I want to sort of follow in their footpath. Am I loud enough? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, yes. very good. Okay, good, good, good. So I'm going to lead you down a path that is a very strange and new one. I want to connect classical matrix theory with matrix computations in a new way. Okay. So field of values computations are old, field of values of a matrix, and they study a parameter varying matrix eigenvalue problem. Okay. I used these computations and the tricks that were invented about 40 years, 50 years ago uh, to solve a century old ma matrix unitary block linearization problem that came out of Niels Bohr's uh, uh, circle in Göttingen and Copenhagen about quantum physics and was still open today. So on the way, we need to understand time varying and parameter varying matrix problems theoretically and computationally. I was introduced to Zhang neural networks that are part of zero neural networks uh, by Centralbad, who sent me a book by Yunong Zhang, who invented it as a graduate student in Hong Kong in 2002. His neural networks, he didn't call them that. It took 20 years that he was <laughs> acknowledged and that they were called after him. Okay. And that these uh, neural networks are being used today in hundreds of ways in modern engineering, robot control, uh, artificial intelligence, and so forth and so on, optimization. But their numerical behavior is barely understood. CNN methods pose many open problems and form a new non-Wilkinsonian, non-backward stable branch of numerical matrix flow analysis. Okay. In return, when we come to the end of this talk, we will look at uh, CNN methods for flows that can solve, that can help us solve some intractable computational problems for fixed entry matrices. So there is a life going back and forth. Okay, let's go one further. Here we are. Okay, so here we are in a river in the jungle in Costa Rica. I came back about two weeks ago from there and I walked the jungle path here in the river. There are rocks of information we, we are studying. We know what, what you do in, in, in this part of the world is clearly, but there is some sort of danger. If you look very carefully, here you can see the bank of the river over here. This is the mm. dark part. It's all over mm. arched. The canopy is closed. And I wouldn't walk there because it gets deeper there. Here, here it's riffling on the rocks, but here it gets deep. And that's where the Caymans live. So in some sense, we have to be very careful how we deal in the new area of mathematics. <laughs> yeah? And so... <laughs> And this is sort of a warning to all of us to do very careful steps. Okay, I want to look at the interaction of matrix theory and computational matrix analysis. Here's the field of values, how we compute that nowadays efficiently. Here are the Zhang neural networks for uh, parameter varying uh, matrix problems. Here are time varying matrix flows that they treat each other here. And then we have a unitary block diagonalization question. Okay, I have four strands. One is orange, one is blue, one is green, one is black. So let's see. Oh, oh ah, I can't do it here. I have to go here, here, here. Okay, good. So here in the matrix field of values starts with the Bendixson rectangles that enclose the field of values for the maximum uh, Hermitian matrices, Hermitian part and semi uh, um, skew Hermitian part of a matrix. Here, Johnson created a form, a, a flow, a matrix flow for the Hermitian part and the skew part of the matrix A. And then he compute the eigendata here. And later on, very recently, Loisel and Maxwell published a SIAM paper on path following methods for using ODEs. So it's a speed up over this fashion here, too much eigenvalue computations here. You just start from an ODE problem from a starting value and you go around the field of values. But this fails for decomposable matrices. That's where we have to come into this branch eventually. So Zhang neural networks, I told you from 2002, 
reduces matrix flow problems. A matrix flow is always a time bearing. That's sort of like the river, it's a flow. Uh, so discretized discretize linear system solves and convergent look ahead recurrences uh, evaluations. Now, time bearing matrix flow, I don't know where they started. Uh, Hund and von Neumann and Wigner in the 1920s created some decomposability symptoms for Hermitian flows. We want to figure this out later, quantum physics. That led to all sorts of studies of eigencurves because the uh, matrix here has various eigencurves. If you go from uh, uh, if you go from t equals zero to two pi, the curve moves. All the curves move, and uh, so you study eigencurves crossings. Where eigencurves cross, something might go. This is the bad thing here. Okay, next case. Oh, I have to go up here. I have to be concentrated. Thank you. Okay, so. Here, eventually, I looked at these things and I looked at these uh, Zang neural networks, and there was always the engineers uh, wrote down the equation that they got out of the problem of, uh, of, of the physical problem, engineering problem, and solved it with a certain way of doing it. And I had no idea how they even find convergent and look ahead finite difference formulas. They were done actually found by Zhang's group in Guangzhou. It's now under lockdown, I think. It's horrible. So anyway, <laughs> COVID lockdown, and and they they uh, uh, took pencil and paper and worked it out over the rationals. I, I did a constructive constructive uh, method, and you will learn about that eigencurve crossing. Finally, re quite recently, I figured out how to unitarily block diagonalize a static matrix and how it relates to the matrix flows of uh, Johnson Charlie Johnson. Okay. Oh, I have to go back here. Yes. Okay. So here are the uh, connections from Ben Nixon. We go to here, eigencurve crossings go this way and so forth. And eventually I submitted a paper, an overview of Zang neural network networks. I, I, I treat about a dozen systems. I do all sorts of extra explanations that is not available in the engineering literature. The Chinese generally do not explain what they do. They know it works. They know how to make porcelain. So they keep the secret, uh, the way to make porcelain private. Mm -hmm. It's sort of old fashioned. It's not a critique, it's just a fact. And so. Mm. <laughs> and Man, there is uh, some uh, sort of. Uh, 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 Manfred, secret, Manfred, secrecy. Manfred, Manfred, Manfred. Manfred. Can you can you uh, uh, quiet your 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 okay uh, okay okay I made it voice where can I put it oh. on the bottom there's voice and video video is on voice is off good thank you okay so eventually I started this unitary block generalization for uh, field of values computation then that's even better and that's wonderful so this is what I want to sort of explain to you and all these connections. And then, of course, this simplifies all uh, unitary equivalent numerical computations that we have on matrices. We can use that not just for the field of values uh, function here. We can do that for everything. All right. So let's go up here. Uh, yeah. Okay. So my start came from Loison and Maxwell paper. Okay. It's either. Uh, they differentiated the time bearing eigenvector eigenvalue equation for f of a, the flow matrix, evaluated this at one starting point and used ODE integrators to follow this curve. Okay. And actually, the differentiation is very different from what we do. We have to do some differentiation in some neural networks. It's a completely different matrix. Okay. However, this approach will fail. Okay, here's some, uh, once again the explanation of the eigencurve crossings. What is H? H is the Hermitian part, and here it's not the skew Hermitian part. If it had an I here, it would be the skew Hermitian part. I call it the skew part. Okay. Okay, so let's keep on going. And I don't know, in 10 minutes or so, I will make a little pause and we can ask, ask questions. Okay. So, uh, the quantum physicists wanted to establish two facts, a good establish two facts about unitarily decomposable Hermitian matrix flow. Hermitian, unitarily decomposable. So there is a 
unitary matrix that you can use the similarity on the flow and all the matrices and they always get a block form, okay? If two eigencurves of the Hermitian matrix will cross, cross each other, then the flow can be unitarily decomposed into block diagonal form with at least two blocks. The curves belong, if you have eigen to, if eigen curves cross in the graph from zero to two pi and they cross, then they belong to separate diagonal blocks here. If two eigen curves approach each other and then veer off like the branches of a hyperbola do, then the associated eigenvalues belong to the same diagonal block if A of T is blocked in, in, by unitary similarity. So if we have two curves going and one gets close to the other and then suddenly it's oof, it, it veers off. You can look at this, you can study this geometrically, numerically, then these curves must belong to the same block. And I have hit a button, that's the wrong button. Ah, excuse me. Okay, okay. These two results suffice to settle quantum physics question of high atomic number element creation from primeval gases. Is it now still true? Okay, because if, they, uh, if, if yeah, you can, you can see the, the reverse arrows here are wrong. You can like see a simple example, okay? Okay, there was extensive studies of eigencurves of matrices, but they mostly study the relationship of the flow uh, the relation of the flow being analytic or otherwise with the properties of a reducing matrix flow that gives A of T a joint normal form for every T. And such diagonal block diagonalization does not even appear here because you make these matrices also flows, these similar, you know, orthogonal similarities here. So this is a complete different uh, subject that was breed, uh, done by many, many people, many, many papers. Okay, these results can be generalized of generalized to singular value curves and multi-parameter matrices and so forth and so forth. Okay, so I came upon the unitary block diagonalization here. And it's obvious if you have a matrix A that is block diagonalized by unitary similarity, then both of these matrices will be block diagonalized. And so then this flow will be block diagonalized into the same block pattern by the same unitarily, unitary similarity, x, x star, or x star, x, this makes no difference, okay? So uh, let me explain how this goes. Here is the sort of theorem. It's, it looks very complicated. What you do is you look at the, I'm, I'm giving you a constructive proof. You can go through uh, unitary uh, invariant eigenspaces and so forth, but Let's look at the flow, call it B of T, the one of uh, Charlie Johnson, okay? Okay, now you take a matrix B of T zero, anyone you want, and form a unitary matrix that diagonalizes this first fellow here by similarity. This is gonna be diagonal. Now ask the question, how does B zero operate by unitary similarity on, a, on another Hermitian flow? Now, this flow better not be the same or linear dependent of this. So this flow here should be linearly independent of B of T0. B of T1 should not be a multiple of B of T0, okay? So how do we do this? We look at the VZ zero. There's an invariant subspace of B of T, uh, the, yeah. We look at B of T and we look at the zeros or near zero entries in the same similarity transformation unitary that you did on B of T zero on B of T one. If they have individual subspaces that block together, then all these entries, uh, many of these entries should be zero. But, and of course, computationally, this is impossible to achieve. Ah, think, think, thank you. Oops, I'm almost not, not visible here. Okay, okay. So what you do is you set all sufficiently small magnitude entries of the second uh, block uh, uh, flow matrix equal to zero. And then you look at this spy matrix in, in or the zero one pattern matrix in MATLAB here. And then you have to resort those into adjacent vector groups and define the column vector arrangement that will block diagonalize B of T1 then any other flow is block diagonalized this one. Think about it. 
The first BT0 is diagonalized. So this is the finest one you can get, but that is too strict. If this gets into a pattern where I have zero one patterns coming, going down and I can, can put these all up by rearranging the eigenvectors in B0, then, ah, here I can, ah, here, here, oh, good heavens. <laughs> now I know where I can do this. Okay, I don't need it anymore. Then I can do it for everything. And this is a beautiful thing. So this is again, uh, matrix computations right-hand side. Here, we're going to Zang neural networks now. We've gone through this part, the orange part, we're gonna to go to the blue part, and we have gone here to the unitary block diagonalization. All right, so let me go one up, one down, I guess. Matrix computation, the orange and blue arrows. This is clear, the rotated Bendixson boxes. Here's the simplest Bendixson box from uh, 19, uh, 1902. 120 years old. So this is a, a, a point on the boundary of the field of values. And this is a, a point and so forth. So we take this box in, in black and we rotate it. We just take it and move it over here. So the tangent will now for, uh, for, the, for, the, for this angle here, T, will be here and here and here and here. And we keep on doing this. We move, rotate it again to here and we get another point. And we can take many exits, um, many, many angles, short angles, and, and, and we can find lots of points on the, on the boundary of the field of values. Okay, so now let's go to Zhang neural networks. Let me see, am I, am I in the right position? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay, Zhang neural networks are designed to solve single parameter varying matrix or vector problems predictively in real time. These are very important uh, properties. To test ZNN against the ODE pathfinding methods computation, I had to learn how ZNN works and how to set this one up. The engineering literature is huge, huge. there are 400 some papers and four or five books on the subject, but there are no usable details, no numerical analysis on how and why CNN works. So we are in the dark part of numerical analysis, matrix analysis. CNN is much different from anything we know from analytic continuation ODE solving methods, okay? ODE solvers integrate a derivative equation to find the numerical antiderivative and they rely on the explicit right-hand side function X. Uh, at, at times before. The methods, methods, however, do not solve these, nor can they be used for that purpose. I have sometimes been uh, tempted to say, oh, I know how to do it. I know how to do it, as this trick is. But when I try to do this, when I solve an ODE problem with the ZNN methods, I always come up with a tautology, X is X but no equation for X, nothing to solve. But besides they're predictive and computing the system solution at a future time from data at earlier times. Uh, these differences are, are very hard to fathom, ZNN being completely different from all we know. They, I think they form a new area of numerical analysis that lies completely outside of our, of our classical uh, analysis uh, numerical analysis uh, knowledge ba basis. I see this constantly when I send a paper to the Western Journal and they give me all these wonderful things that, you know, uh, that they're all just ODE solvers and so forth. And I go now and, and slowly over time, thank you for all the referees. I have learned to, to understand how different ZNN methods are. Okay. So here's my description of CNN for time varying matrix computations. Yeah. Okay. We start with any continuous time varying vector matrix model, anything, an equation in A, B to T, X of T is the unknown, and G is T, other things, and so forth. It can be rectangular, it can be squared, it can be. A, an optimization problem, it can be Grand-Lagrange multipliers, anything you want to. And we want to, uh, with time varying unknown vector or matrix X of T. 
And with compatibility size, of course, these things have to match each other if they multiply and so forth and so on. Okay, how do we do this? There are seven steps to have a note of CNN. <laughs> okay, so you form the error equation. You are, uh, sub subtract the right-hand side from the left-hand side and say, that's the error at T. If I have this function of these guys and subtract them, there should be ideally the zero matrix, right? Now we differentiate this function and they are getting into trouble, right? The, <laughs> the K-mans are waiting in the dark, stop, uh, the dark jungle, I have to be careful, and stipulate exponential decay so that E, the derivative of E with respect to T is minus positive constant times E. It's the standard E to the uh, eta the tau is the solution in one dimension, right? The exponential decay constant here, okay? Now, we look at this function, this equation, and we try to solve this differential equation. No, 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 algebraically. We want to separate out the derivative of the unknown, if possible, so that x dot of tk equates to a time varying linear equation because all the other things are plus or minus and, and times and whatever. If impossible, we must reconsider our initial problem. Maybe that function was not, not well chosen. Uh, we revise the model, we retry, or we use Kronecker matrix products if they occur here when you differentiate, when, you, when, when the product rule goes into effect for these conglomerations here. So that's one way, algebraically solving the differential equation. All the EFO solvers don't do that, right? <laughs> okay, uh, and select the look ahead convergent finite difference formula for the desired truncation error. You specify that, that expresses the same derivative in terms of the future time, earlier time, and in terms of J plus S known starting data points. What are these guys? I don't know, I have no idea. Okay, then we take this formulation and that formulation and equate them. Equate the derivative terms in steps three and four, four on the right and left hand side. And then we have something only that have the linear equation sitting in the equation and this, this thing here. And now you go solve for the future time. Then you have the future time in terms of a linear equation and formal earlier data. Okay, okay, we solve it for xdk. And that looks very, very simple. It took me, I don't know, a trip to Oxford, a trip to here and there, and I could never, we could never figure it out in hours and hours of thinking. So it's very interesting that it goes that way. Let me see if this now works. Yeah, this now works. Oh, I don't have to go up there. By design, in step two, the computing uh, ZNN errors are always governed by exponential decay as time progresses. Remember, it goes to zero, the errors. Therefore, the choice of starting values uh, pro uh, processes hardly matter. Every chosen set of starting points reasonable. I mean, don't start a million miles off for ZNN converges exponentially faster the solution up to avoidable, unavoidable truncation errors, okay? In steps five and six, the ZNN replaces the solution derivatives by linear equation solve and the recurrence relations. This makes ZNN methods extremely fast. There's hardly anything to compute and they can be implemented in real time on, disc on, disc on discrete data coming from sensors. They're perfect and on ship in practical industrial applications. You can send them to Mars, we will learn, and they can do this, what they are supposed to do. Typically, the computation of the DNN and any time step takes 1% or 8% of the gap. Tau, if, if, if you have 50 Hertz sensor inputs, okay? Some of these tools and steps occur nowhere else in numerical procedures and require explanation. So the first thing I want to do is I want to explain how to get look ahead and conversion finite difference formulas of any error order, okay? There has previously had been no need for look ahead and conversion finite difference schemes. Find a different, uh, find a, uh, convergent multi-step predictor corrector methods all only solve without Adams, Bashford, Forth, and Adams, Moulton, and Fehlberg, and Gear. Uh, use those, but these steps, uh, these uh, convergent multi-step formulas are not the ones that we need here, 
we need these guys with the end, okay? So I explained how they were found, the early ones in, by the students. And so we needed a strategic, a strategic approach to construct convergent and local head finite difference formulas, okay? Oh, my, my algorithm, I don't know, there might be 20 others, you can go and find a better one, has two phases. First, a linear, a matrix-based one that constructs a look-ahead finite difference formula from a random coefficient input, followed by a nonlinear refinement phase that uses some optimization to have, have both convergent and look-ahead formula if such exists, okay? Okay, so here, recall that a finite difference formula, Z of T car and with alphas and so forth and so forth, of length L plus L plus one, I think, is convergent if its characteristic polynomial replaces the Z by X and the, these by powers here, uh, has only roots within a closed unit circle uh, of C and all roots on the unit circle are simple. Okay. Okay. So we construct look ahead, find a difference from us by using repeated Taylor expansions to constrict look ahead and convergent finite requires a nonlinear optimization process. Success rates are relatively good for low error orders. For higher error orders, I've set, let the computer do 100,000 searches and after dinner, I got 30 uh, look ahead and convergent in, uh, finite difference formulas of error order 10 to the eight. You know, we don't need 10 to the eight, 10 to the five, 10 to the six, um, basically good enough. We know that from, 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 from ODE method. Okay, so let's go and see. Now, here we go in the first linear step. We do something that is almost uh, illegal. We assume high differentiability and use Taylor expansions, expands at the point ahead in terms of the point where we are and previous points. And then this gets this formula here with all the higher derivatives coming up. And this braced area here, I want to create uniformly, make it equal to zero. Then this drops out. And then we have a formula for the future with the current things and the derivative at the current time for which we have a formula. And then we have the error order here. But this goes completely against uh, high differentiability, right? But, you know, we're doing it with discrete uh, uh, sampling gaps. This is a finite number. So what happens in between with the X derivatives here, does it really matter? You know, what if the arm of a robot bumps against the wall and it does, does sort of an absolute value, this uh, undifferentiability? And it seems to work. And why it works, I have no idea, okay? So let me see. Uh, I can express this here in a nice way. I can express this here. There are all these powers and, and, and minus one signs in the denominators and the L, whatever. There's a matrix. There's a column vector matrix here. I have no idea if this matrix is a rational num matrix, if it ever appeared anywhere. You can figure it out for the low dimensions that, that are needed for you know F order error order eight up to that. It's, it is invertible, okay? The over and under brace terms in regions of between equations three and eight have the matrix times vector presentation. Here are all the derivatives, the higher order ones with these powers of tau. They should be here and then these should be behind here. And there is the matrix A, it's sort of this matrix. now. How can I make this stuff, which is under the over under brace stuff, how can I make this go to zero? Well, uh, if we find a left row kernel, made a kernel vector here, then it's a zero matrix, a zero vector. So this times a y becomes then this, this vector y times this is zero uniformly. This could be anything in the world, I don't care. This is a zero times anything is zero in my book, okay? So, okay. So we have what we wanted then, but it's only a look ahead formula. We're trying a single look ahead formula from a random 
uh, prescription of, uh, okay. So when do we have such a non-zero left kernel vector? As soon as the dimension of rows is much larger than this, as soon as we have this. So some, uh, finding such a vector is very easy using the echelon form of a, tra a transpose in MATLAB. Okay, to find a convergent look-ahead finite difference formula from a look-ahead seed a polynomial Z that we got here. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> we try to minimize the maximal magnitude characteristic polynomial root of polynomials near Z. Okay, the set of characteristic polynomials is not a is not a linear space. So the sums of such may or may not represent look at different schemes. We have to search indirectly for a characteristic polynomial with smaller maximal magnitude root in a neighborhood of the look ahead formula coefficients in Z that we got from the linear phase. Okay, we use a minimization process built in, it's called F min search. And we let it run for a while and sometimes it gives us a function that has a maximum magnitude polynomial root less than or equal to one. That would be wonderful. Sometimes in 1% of the tries, sometimes in 25% of the times, ties. But it will find it, or there is no such polynomial near that scene. Okay? Not everywhere is gold in the jungle, but <laughs> somewhere there is. Okay. So how does this actually work? We have to illustrate the seven steps. We use a time varying matrix global eigenvalue problem. A times an eigenvector uh, matrix is eigenvector matrix times an diagonal matrix. Let's assume we have a diagonal flow that is sort of standard in engineering problems. Repeated eigenvalues and Jordan form matrices are really men made. They don't exist, 99.9% .9 are diagonalizable. And there are ways to overcome this. We can solve this problem, problem directly. We don't have to assume this. If we use the chronicle canonical form to get the mixed unknowns on the right and on the left of matrix products. And that's more difficult, I don't want to do this. So here's the i-th problem. Axi is lambda ixi. Here is this, form the difference, you want to have a zero vector, demand exponential EK, okay? Now you write this out, and this is sort of the hardest part for me. Oops, I want to go back. This is the hardest part. I can never differentiate correctly. Here's the product rule on this vector, the product rule on this uh, term. On the, on the right-hand side is eta times this, and now you have to juggle. This one has unknown, this one has unknown, this one has unknown. So you write it as down here in 5i, all the time varying derivatives are over here, and here's the rest of the world. Okay, so you can write this a little bit differently. Okay, gives us this one. Now we have actually unknown vector, n vector, and an unknown number, the lambda i. So if you make it one dimension larger than the vector on top, the eigenvector corresponding below, then we have this system of differential equations. This is a completely equivalent to this one, just written out here, this times that minus this times that. There it is. And this is the other hand here, and take it factoring out the xi of t. Okay. Okay. So now, eigenvectors are only defining invariant one-dimensional subspaces of the matrix, right? So we must ensure that the compute and eigen, computed eigenvectors in this process grow, do not grow infin infinitely smaller, infinitely large. So we require that they have unit length asymptotically. So here's the secondary uh, error equation. Here's, here's the eigenvector norm squared minus one is equal to one, stipulating exponential decay. We differentiate, we get this, and we have a second k constant. Okay. 
Let's go and put this together. If we use mu the secondary uh, eigen uh, secondary uh, decay equation uh, equal to two times eta, then we get the same thing here. And we get this eta here and here and here, and everything is fine. So we have a matrix n plus n plus n, n plus n, which is Hermitian. If A is Hermitian, that's wonderful. We have the eigendata vector, and we have the right hand side, which is some sort of a mess. This can just be computed by backward analysis. How does the uh, matrix A change? That's all. So we have. A differential equation now, we can solve it formally. That's what we want in step four or five. I forgot the number. And now it was step three. Now we choose the finite difference formula. I chose a small one with certain constants here that I don't want to talk about. It has a truncation error order of tau to the three. This is it. So if we multiply this equation by 18 tau and that uh, uh, the right hand side by 18 tau, we get this equation from here to here, governed by the star, okay? So now solve this, uh, take this out, then you have to divide the 18 by eight, you get nine over, over pi, then you get the tau here, then you get this, this matrix equation, uh, linear, uh, linear equation to solve. And here is the, everything divided by, here is what, what it comes out, okay? Iterate the process. Okay, now the only formula 13i is needed to be implemented in code. And that's what you finally find in the literature. They give you these numbers and these numbers, how they get them is up to never explained. <laughs> I feel I'm, 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 I'm sort of stealing from them, from their mental ideas of what, okay? But I, what is necessary to do this for all sorts of different problems. Okay, so now how to implement this? So here you've set up the, the local matrix. Uh, and here you have the P. This is the matrix then. You augment it by the uh, uh, eigendata. You get the tau coefficient tau. This is the right-hand side. The right-hand side. You solve the linear equation in MATLAB. You set up the new eigendata for next point. You put it on and there it is. So the only thing that you do computationally is this. You create a matrix, you uh, scalar multiples, a dot has to be, uh, the derivative of a has to be computed somewhere else in this and these things. The four bar central code lines express the computational essence of step six. Only in these lines is math performed the rest of the DNA program, program code are input reads and output saves and preparations. So it's very fast. So let us ask what is computed in the finite difference screen 13i. What is, there's a linear part and there's a recursion part, linear equation part. Okay. So where and how does the stipulated exponential decay of the error function actually enter? It has gone away. The, different, the dif differential equation is no longer visible. So now let's look at the characteristic polynomial coefficients of a finite difference scheme. They must add, to, add up to zero for convergence. So here's this finite difference scheme. That's what we do. It is a characteristic polynomial. And uh, if you stick in a one everywhere, you get here one, 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 uh, one, 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 as SZK. You get P of one is just the sum, must be zero. We know that from zero stability of finite different schemes in uh, ODE solving. Or approximately we have, when we go back to this thing, this thing here is approximately zero. That's very interesting, it's approximately zero. So if this is approximately zero, then this term here, the new iterate should be approximately this with reverse signs, minus plus minus plus minus, right? So with the local truncation error for our, of course, it's for our specific finite difference formula. Now look at this again. So this is all the meat. And if you look very carefully and you measure the size of this term, the output here, you, under, you learn that it's three or four digits down from the 
absolute value of this from the magnitude of this entry here. So this is actually where the finite difference term comes in because it relates to the various A's and the various inputs. And it relates to the input. This is sort of completely independent of it, of the input. And this makes the input vary a little bit. And that's what it is. And so the linear equation solve is very uncrucial in engineering terms. If you have the first three or four digits of anything engineering wise, you're oftentimes happy. So here I am looking at the method exemplified for time varying matrix square root computations. Okay. Here I use this other formula. I use an eta. I have n equal to five and five. So I start somewhere here and it jumps up a little bit. Then it goes down very, very fast, it goes down to amount 10 to the minus 11, and then it continually goes to zero. It gets better and better. It goes down to 10 to the minus 13 or 14 now, right? So you see that the exponential decay keeps on going, and the little wiggles are due to the input. The, the, yeah? the input comes and adds something and adds something, and on average, it goes wonderfully down. And of course, it doesn't matter because it's only 13 digits down. Who cares in engineering or solutions? All right. So now I have, oh, oh, oh yeah, well, I have, okay, okay. Ideally, discretized codes should be independent of external, pro, of external, external programs for ready on chip use. Of course, here we use the MATLAB linear equation solver, the backslash, backslash. okay? So one can do one way, one can uh, double down the ZNN computation and embed a time varying linear equation solver as well inside our eigensolver code. Makes it a little more complicated, a little longer, but take a little longer, but it's insignificant, okay? Okay, so in our time, our uh, the picture that I just showed you covered 360 seconds or six minutes, and the whole computations took 1.5 seconds for every 50th second of 360 seconds. So clearly it can be uh, uh, implemented in real, real time on chip applications, okay? So another problem is how do you start up? You need some initial value problems for the finite difference formula use, okay? So we start oftentimes from a random startup vector, who cares? and then iterate uh, the necessary times for the chosen uh, finite difference formula via Euler. This is what Euler does. It is an unstable uh, finite difference scheme because it only has the roots plus one and minus one. It goes down for a while, it behaves very well for 10, 20 times, and then suddenly it fiddles out and then suddenly whoop, it goes away. It has low error, but its inaccuracies do not hinder the exponential error decay functions at the beginning. Okay, so uh, time varying ZNN methods are solution path following methods, of course. They home in onto the solution and they're much faster than o ODE path following uh, methods. And they are also more accurate. They are akin to predictor corrector ODE solvers but are not predictor corrector methods. They are, the difference are due to the genial exponent error decay requirement and is hidden error ODE implementation by you know. So, and that's a wonderful thing to have done. So here's our map. This is what we have done. I've tried to explain. I've tried to explain this paper. I've tried to explain even an overview, a construction, and well, that's what we have. We're almost done. Open problems. The Taylor expansions and error estimates work well with non-differentiable inputs here. With jump discontinuity and with partially randomized inputs alike. I have to put in some uh, uh, time varying in A of T where I put in certain positions, three or four positions, I put in a, just a random number in MATLAB. And so, when it comes over to different t, suddenly a different number appears in a certain position. And what the decades is going on? It works, it doesn't, it doesn't balk, it doesn't do anything. Why? What's the theory behind this non-standard numerical analysis? I remember in uh, 
lectures on analysis, we were told that we could make any jump function. If there was a little difference, we could make an infinitely differentiable connection to them with an e to the minus whatever, so and so x squared, uh, something like that. I don't quite know how that is. And maybe, you know, maybe <laughs> all the jump data that comes in can be explained through such a thing and can be made infinitely diff differentiable. Now, next thing is what is the best uh, uh, for specific uh, uh, co coefficients, convergence, look ahead discretization formula. I have no idea what's the difference between the six, 5.7 or six, uh, six formula. Why are they actually different? Are they different? And they add up to the identical number and they have sort of the same behavior. I can't explain what the differences are. It's outside the time limit here. Now, uh, the optimal exponential decay constant and, and the certain coefficients are varying for specific problem from specific problem with the same method. Given one time varying problem and a fixed difference equation scheme, uh, fix, fix the uh, J and S and the tau, the product H times tau times eta stays reasonably constant when the sampling gap is changed. When the eta gets smaller, the tau has to be bigger to get the same convergence pattern. But for differing problems treated under the, discrete, under the same discretized ZNN method, the near constant S, H, that is constant by, you know, in a, in a hyperbolic way, so to speak, by, by the product staying constant here, can vary dramatically. What difference inside the time varying problem cause these variations of H and of optimal eta? I have no idea. It's weird. Sometimes, sometimes the optimal age is around one, sometimes the optimal age is around 10, sometimes the optimal age is around uh, 0.1 and the same, the same, the same J and S and everything the same, but the problem has been changed. There's still the open quantum physics problem. We don't know really whether, you know, the primal gases themselves with the process of concretization and high pressure and high temperature and so forth, were, came from one uh, uh, from, from one element and created gold and iron and all the heavier atomic number uh, things. Or if maybe nitrogen and oxygen work together to create silver, I have no idea. And that is not, uh, in quantum physics, is not so solved because I don't know where the uh, Hermitian matrix flow idea came from. There's no reference, there are no references to specific quantum physics uh, uh, things. So resources, starting with Euler 254 years ago, 100 and some, some years ago, and, and everything at least 40 years ago, I call historical. Most recent 40 years, DSC in uh, Georgia Tech and, and PISA, no, wait a second, I think PISA, or if, if, I, if, I, if, if I missed it, it's somewhere in Italy. In the, in the Toscana, has written and is still writing with many other people's papers. And here's one, here's Murata, here's my Eigen curve paper. Here's the Leusel and Maxwell uh, trying to find ways to deal with decomposing um, matrix uh, matrices and the field of values problem. Okay, continued, we go to the next page. Okay, here are some papers. And here, if I have E, uh, in preparation, I've adapted the ZN method to uh, time varying matrix flow problems. Normally, the eta, the decay constant, is constant. And I found out that if we change the decay constant in the initial phase, in the building up uh, the, 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 the first starting vectors, starting values, then I can get much better results. Okay. And I've also <laughs> thought of in the time at certain points, I can change the tau, uh, the eta again. And this adapts and it helps me find, uh, solve the matrix symmetrizer uh, problem, which for which Freuler and Dupico and I wrote a paper in 2013 <laughs> with seven algorithms that rely heavily on Blas and Wilkinsonian methods to deal with these problems. And we have found in the end, as soon as they are uh, 
the repeated eigenvalues or Jordan blocks in the flow, then everything goes out the way. It doesn't work. If we don't find a, 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 an invertible symmetrizer on the left of A, then we have to multiply to the right by this inverse to get a product of factorization. You do that with a QR too. You have the A here, you take the Q, multiply it to find an upper triangular, and we wanted to find the product of two. And if we do this with a singular matrix here that symmetrizes into a singular matrix, it doesn't work, okay? And so it's interesting, we've done this and I've done this, we have a two by two example that we cannot with all the seven methods that we have there. So get a, a, a invertible two by two symmetrizer. We can do this with the adapted uh, version of the uh, decay constants. So this is all that I wanted to say. And let me see, there's one more picture, I think. We've taken you to the jungle. And here is the other jungle. Here comes the flow from the right. The, these white things are balsa tree seeds. They're big, fluffy, and there's a tiny little kernel. You can't bite it. It's so hard like, as a rock. And here is a black heron, and there's life at the end of the tunnel. But we have to enter the tunnel that is to the right here. We have to go in there, and we have to study. As numerical analysts, we have to study flow matrices, matrix flows. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say, I think. I have to thank you. And you can see my talk slides here for the last couple of weeks. And you can download them and you can maybe help me. Somebody can help me with a physics problem and maybe you can get a, a Nobel Prize if you find something that <laughs> Niels Bohr and that group did not know about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> maybe our, maybe yeah. our table of uh, elements in chemistry has to be branched differently. But I don't yeah, know. Frank, I thank you very much for this talk. It was very interesting, but uh, I couldn't follow only maybe 10% uh, I have. That's good. 